right. Um, thank you, everybody, for coming to my talk. Um, my name is Andrew, and I'm going to be telling you today about some of the work I've been doing recently, looking at um, differences in venom comp compositions in two closely related species of cones. Um, venoms are really powerful systems for studying the genetic basis and function of adaptive traits. Um, because they typically uh, fill, a, they're confined to discrete ecological roles, um, such as prey capture and defense, and also because um, the also because the uh, uh, things like uh, changes in transcription and patterns of gene evolution um, can be associated directly with shifts in ecology. My study system um, is a genus of predatory marine gastropod called Conus. Um, the genus includes some 700 species uh, of, of snails, um, and they are distributed throughout the tropics worldwide. This makes them the most diverse genus of marine metazoans that we know of. Um, cone snails are uh, cone snails are uh, notorious for their use of venoms to capture prey items, um, and niche space is, is structured according to diets, which are typically very narrow. Um, and highly specific. They can be categorized into three broad categories, um, worm eaters, um, fish eaters, and mollusk eaters. As I said, cone snails uh, use highly toxic uh, and quite complex venom to capture prey items. Their prey items are quite sizable and oftentimes much more agile than the cone snail itself. Um, in this video clip, you're going to see this conus bulatus individual envenomate and engulf this Um, like I said, uh, cone snail venom is extremely complex. Um, a single individual may produce as many as 200 unique venom components in its venom gland, which I have a diagram up here. Um, the, uh, the venom components are known as conotoxins. Um, most conotoxins are small, um, neurotoxic peptides that range between 10 and 40 amino acids in length. Um, conotoxin genes exhibit rapid rates of gene duplication and some of the highest rates of evolution that have been observed in metazoans. Um, conotoxins are organized into 26 common gene superfamilies, um, which, are, uh, uh, which are arranged by differences in the signal sequence in a precursor molecule um, and by highly conserved cysteine motifs in the mature peptide. Um, while uh, superfamily does not necessarily strictly uh, predict function um, or molecular target, um, certain superfamilies are associated with particular uh, ecological specializations such as fish eating. Um, a common hypothesis uh, to explain the uh, strong interspecific divergence in diets uh, and the rapid evolution of venom components is that uh, selection acts to, um, for venom to uh, function particularly well on specific prey items. Um, and this hypothesis is pretty well supported in the literature. Um, some of the largest ecological transitions, such as the transition from ancestral worm eating to fish eating, um, have been implicated, or venom has been implicated in those ecological transitions. Um, venom function may change in a couple of different ways. Um, the first of those, generally, is uh, non synonymous mutations may uh, arise in conotoxin genes that, that result in, in changes in function. Um, and this, uh, there, there is ample support for this mechanism in the literature. Um, for example, Duda and Lee. Um, describe uh, an Easter Island population of Conus miliaris um, that is exposed to, to a novel prey assemblage relative to non-Easter Island populations. Uh, and there are uh, a large number of substitutions in, in several conotoxin genes that are associated with that um, uh, shift to a novel prey assemblage. The second way uh, that venom function may change um, is due to the fact that different conotoxins uh, have different molecular targets and um, <coughs> due to the potential for synergistic effects between different conotoxin, um, conotoxin components. Um, we don't know too much uh, about how uh, changes in venom composition uh, track shifts in ecology, um, and we don't know too much about how um, venom composition varies across the phylogeny of cones. Um, this is because we don't have a lot of transcriptomes. Um, the ones that we do have uh, are uh, fairly widely scattered across a very large phylogeny of cone snails. So while we understand 
that uh, there are broad differences in the venom composition um, as determined by superfamily um, between fish eaters like Conus geographus and Conus pilatus, and we don't know a lot about um, the scale at which, the phylogenetic scale at which those sorts of patterns begin to emerge. Um, so to understand the, um, the diversification of conus um, and the role that, that venom may play in, in that process, it's important to understand and ask how, um, shifts in, how venom composition tracks shifts in ecology and how it varies across the phylogeny of conus. Um, a former postdoc from our lab, David Weiss, is, is making good progress on the ecological component of this question. Um, he has sequenced and assembled the transcriptome, the venom gland transcriptomes of 22 conus miliaris individuals from three populations that experience different, um, uh, that experience uh, novel prey assemblages across the Pacific. Um, in the course of this project, though, he also uh, sequenced and assembled the transcriptomes for two closely related, two closely related um, individuals uh, from conus coronatus. Um, the inclusion of, of, these two, of these two individuals gave me the opportunity to address the other component uh, of this question um, and assess the uh, scale, the phylogenetic scale at which um, differences in venom composition uh, begin to emerge. Um, in the course of this project, uh, I, I took the two conus coronatus individuals um, that David sequenced uh, and I randomly selected two conus miliaris individuals from the American Samoa population. Um, all four of these are uh, from the American Samoa population. Um, I then constructed uh, a, a custom database uh, using proteins from the Kono server database, um, the NCBI protein database, and the Unipro database, all uh, conus proteins. And then I locally annotated them using the Blastex um, method. Um, I extracted uh, all transcripts that were annotated as conotoxins and compiled non-redundant lists of annotations for all individuals and pooled lists um, for the two species. Um, here I'm showing you a table uh, uh, summarizing the annotations that I did for all individuals. Um, first, you'll notice that um, all individuals and, and the two species uh, I recovered about the same number of superfamilies from each of those. Um, and the uh, same thing for the total number of unique conotoxins that were annotated for each individual and for each species. They're roughly the same. Um, to get an idea of the uh, diversity of, con of, the, of the venom of each of, these, of each of these different species, I calculated Shannon's diversity index um, for um, individuals and then the pooled samples. Um, and again, uh, you can see that uh, the diversity is, is pretty similar for all individuals and both species. Um, as well as even this. Here, um, I'm showing you a, a chart uh, showing you the distribution of, of annotations across the 26 common gene superfamilies, which are on the x-axis here. And the proportion um, of those annotations in the whole venom is shown on the y-axis there. And immediately, you'll notice that there are no striking differences between the composition of these two, um, these two venoms, conus miliaris shown in red and conus coronatus in green. Um, you will notice that they are both dominated primarily by the O1 superfamily and the M superfamily, and the rest of the superfamilies are fairly um, evenly represented by them. Um, in fact, uh, the majority of sequences annotated uh, in each species, uh, they annotated to the, to the same conotoxins, although there are substantial numbers of, an of annotations, as you might expect, um, unique to each species. Um, in this diagram, I'm showing you uh, pairwise comparisons of annotations. These, uh, if you follow um, each line, um, for, from one individual uh, to another individual, the, the box in the center there tells you the number of, of annotations that they share in common. Um, and you'll notice, as you might expect from the data I presented in the last couple of slides, um, that uh, while conspecific share a slightly larger number of, of annotations, uh, the all four individuals in both species share, share quite a few. Uh, what's more striking, actually, about this is the amount of, of intraspecific and intrapopulation variation uh, that this exhibits. So uh, about uh, each of these uh, conspecific pairings, or each individual, sorry, um, uh, had about 100 to 110 unique conotoxins uh, annotated in its, in its venom. Um, and each conspecific pairing only returns about um, 80 to 90. Uh, shared uh, shared kind of toxin. So that, that tells us something about the role that intraspecific variation would be playing. Something else that we don't know much about. 
Um, this is a chart showing you uh, the annotations that were unique to each species. Um, and uh, you can see here that this is basically a recapitulation of the overall distribution of annotations. We don't see any strikingly different patterns uh, of, of superfamily membership. Um, so uh, this is telling us that you know the uh, that the pattern of patterns of um, the gene superfamily variation likely do not uh, begin to differ dramatically at this phylogenetic scale. Um, so, like I said, um, the, this data set allows us sort of a first glimpse into the um, into the differences between venom composition among closely related cones. You know, something we haven't really seen before. Um, and what it shows us is that at this scale, um, at least at the superfamily level, uh, there is not a wide variety, a wide variation in, in venom composition. Um, Things that, that might also be important uh, are within family composition. There might be a lot more variation in there that I did not capture, um, uh, as well as differences in expression level and patterns of evolution. Um, in the near future, um, I'm going to be adding 27 additional tra additional species, um, 27 uh, transcriptomes from 27 additional species to this analysis, which will allow me to fill out um, the Conus miliaris and Conus coronatus clade um, and compare the uh, venom composition of sister species with outgroups. Um, as well as clays that represent fish eaters and mollusk eaters. Um, and I will also add to those analyses, uh, I will compare patterns of evolution between, um, between close relatives as well. Um, with that, I'd like to acknowledge um, these people, uh, especially David Weiss and Tom Duda for providing me with the data that I used um, for these analyses, and I will take any questions you may have. There is uh, some sort of preliminary evidence that a single individual, um, its dietary composition changes over the course of, of, of development. So you have juveniles that eat different things than do adults. And we have, yeah, like I said, pre preliminary evidence that there are um, changes in venom composition that track those changes in diet. So that's not too well sorted out just yet. Yes? Um, so I don't, I don't study now, so I don't know much about them, but um, I heard that basically as the venom travels through the venom duct and uh, is actually used, um, it's filtered out and so the composition is quite different chemically from when it's produced in the gland. Um, could that, um, you know, some of the structures are made for peptides that are filtering that out through the duct, could that influence, um, you know, if you think about maybe the variation on the other side that wouldn't be expressed in the transfer tone. See like the choice of a single individual when they're in the prey. Yeah. Yeah. We don't. So I, I'm not aware of any like filtering mechanism that directly selects particular kind of toxins as it's in the prey. Although um, recently some work has been done to demonstrate that cone snails are at least capable of um, of modulating the venom that they inject um, based on what kind of stimulus they're getting. So if they're getting a defensive stimulus. Basically, the researchers just poke the cone snail with a glass rod. Um, yeah, and then uh, they collected venom from that cone snail. Um, and they determined that that was a almost a black and white difference between the venom that it, it excreted when it was getting a, a predation stimulus, when a fish was being raped or something. Um, and so they can modulate to some level. 